So thank you, David, so much for joining us today. Um, David Spratt is the research director for the Breakthrough National Center for Climate Restoration, which is an independent think tank based in Melbourne, Australia. David has done an invaluable work in publicizing the key structural problems in, in our society around thinking of risk, science communication, and politics around the climate issue. David has also coined the two now widely used concepts of climate code red and climate emergency. Um, I think already back in 2008, if, if, if I've understood correctly. So thank you, David, for being with us today. Thank you very much. It's a great opportunity. Uh, just for a short background for this discussion, we are, are Operatio Arctis, and we believe that we should start uh, researching, funding, and immediate intervention to try to stop the melting of the Arctic sea ice, because that's sea ice is critical, it's going, it's in critical point, and it's going to go if we don't do something about it. And part of this is, part of our job is to think how we could get this operation up and running. And part of this is analyzing why people and the broader public, as well as politicians, and maybe even some, some of the activists still has almost no clue of how bad things already are uh, as of 2022. And your most recent report, Climate Dominoes, which I highly rec recommend for anyone to read, is exactly about this topic. It's about how bad things actually are and what are the risks according to most recent scientific research and expert views. So my quest first question is, David, uh, about tipping points. What are, technically speaking, what are the tipping points and what is the state of the tipping points as of 2022? Thanks very much, Anton. Uh, it's great to be with you. Uh, just to start with uh, the, the term climate emergency, I coined with my colleague uh, Philip Sutton uh, when we wrote the book Climate Code Red. And um, your comments about cooling the Arctic are absolutely uh, um, spot on. We have to do that because the tipping points are now starting to cascade the dominoes falling one onto each other. Um, so I'm not, I'm not a climate scientist. I'm, I'm a, uh, um, unfortunately was trained in economics uh, and have spent the last 15, 20 years uh, looking at, at climate um, and trying to communicate it. And um, a, a, a tipping point is a threshold in the climate system, in big elements of the climate system um, where large change is initiated and the system then moves to a different state. Um, what's interesting about a tipping point is once a process is underway, no further human intervention is necessary to get the system to move from one state to another. So let me give you an example. You have a fridge with a block of ice in it. It's frozen. As soon as you take the ice out of the fridge and put it on the table, the ice is still frozen, but without any further human action, it will melt. So the act of taking the ice from the fridge to the table is the tipping point. Um, or similarly, if you have a hill with a flat top and the ball sitting on the top of the hill, the ball is stable. You push, push, push the ball, it's stable. Then you push it to the edge of the hill and it runs down by itself. So there's a point at the edge of the hill where the ball has passed its tipping point and we'll go from the top of the hill to the bottom. So that's the sort of uh, uh, idea that you get a change, a, dis a, a discrete change in state. Uh, that's often associated with what are called system feedbacks, loops, a feedback, positive feedback loops that push the system further. I mean, the classic example is in the Arctic where uh, warmer conditions melt some of the sea ice. The sea ice reduces in area, the reflectivity of the Arctic changes because reflecting ice is, is replaced by dark colored sea and that produces more heat, which produces more warming. So in the Arctic, we've got a classic example um, of, of, of a system feedback that, that's, that which, which means that the Arctic is now past its, its tipping point. Uh, I guess the last thing to say is that tipping points or systems tipping are often abrupt or non-linear, that is, they're very difficult to project. 
I mean, I remember in 2007 when there was rapid melting of the Arctic sea ice, um, a well-known glaciologist said, it's melting a hundred years ahead of schedule, quote unquote. What he was saying was that the reality of the ice was a hundred years ahead of what the scientists projected. And we see the same thing in the Antarctic, where one of the early uh, IPCC reports said that they expected the Antarctic to be stable for the next 1,000 years. And yet, within a decade, in 2014, we had a paper from Rigno saying some West Antarctic glaciers are already past their tipping point. So it's this abrupt, non-linear, difficult to predict aspect that makes them really challenging. Mm, yes, yes, thank you, David. So in addition to the West Antarctic ice sheet and Arctic, is there some other tipping points that might have well, already been crossed? Or Yes. Um, the obvious ones are largely to do with the cryosphere. So we know, um, and this was reinforced in December at the American Geophysical Union annual conference where there was some more work done on the Thwaites Glacier, uh, which will trigger other glaciers in West Antarctica, uh, in which the media stories around it were calling it the Doomsday Glacier. So what was first discovered in 2014 was really confirmed last year for West Antarctica. Obviously in the Arctic and your part of the world, uh, Arctic sea ice has passed its tipping point. Uh, its area in summer is half of what it was 40 years ago. Its volume has reduced by half so that the volume of sea ice in summer is three quarters uh, reduced already. And the internal dynamics uh, will keep on driving that. Um, last year, Jason Box, uh, a glaciologist uh, said Greenland had passed its point of system stability. And I think there's really good evidence for that. Um, if you look at the, at the recent research, um, there's a lot of, of, of work suggesting that particularly the Eastern Amazon uh, rainforest is now past its tipping point and is actually emitting more carbon than it's storing. Um, in, in my part of the world, um, there are coral reef systems, um, the Great Barrier Reef on the East Coast of Australia which has lost three quarters of its area in the last 40 years. Um, um, so, so, there, so they're examples of, of systems that have already tipped. Yeah, so one might conclude that 1.5 <laughs> degrees Celsius limit is probably not the safest one there is. Well, this, this, this was the point of our report that you know, warming is now 1.2 and it's clear that many systems have passed their tipping points. So, uh, which nobody wants to say because it is politically convenient to talk about 1.5 to 2, but clearly 1.5 is, is really unsafe because those systems will, will, will be cascading. 1.2 now is not safe. Um, we talked to, to coral reef scientists and, and we said, what would be safe for coral reefs? What would stop them having the, these ocean heat waves? And they said, for coral reefs to be healthy, warming would have to be less than 0.5 degrees. Uh, the same thing uh, was said to us unofficially by some Antarctic scientists. And it's, uh, there's, there's work um, due to a process called hysteresis where the path to melting is not the same path to, to reaccumulating the ice, where they said, and, and this is, I think, widely understood by cryosphere scientists now, that you might have to get the global temperature back to the pre-industrial level for those Arctic glaciers to, to restabilize. So certainly in the area of no warming to half a degree of warming uh, compared to the late 19th century would appear to be safe and anything above that is clearly unsafe. Yes, yes, exactly. And this is why we in Operatio Arctis have also thought about like the, uh, 0 0.5 is our sort of the limit. That's our target, and that's that's not something people commonly have or state as their their like sort of warming target. And now we just have to be kind of quite creative and think think outside of the box how we could get get to this kind of levels of warming. I mean, you've got some great scientists on 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 your side. I mean, many years ago when I started working in this area, the great. Jim Hansen, uh, the, then the, the director of climate science at NASA, 
uh, said that he thought that uh, for the cryosphere and particularly for Arctic, uh, the safe space was under 350 parts per million, he said, and likely 325 parts per million. And 325 parts per million is, 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 is half a degree. So, you know, there's good science behind that figure. Yes, yes, yes. We try to, we try to <laughs> follow the good science. Uh, so we, we have quite a um, range of questions. One is about like the public clearly has too optimistic picture of, of what's happening in the climate. And in our analysis, the IPCC reports uh, and especially the SPMs or summary for policymakers are the sort of ground for the mainstream understanding of what's happening with the climate and what are the actual risks and many of the news articles also base based on the SPMs really when the IPCC reports come out. So in your, your view, what are some of the main problems with IPCC reporting and in thinking of them as the sort of highest authority for assessing risk and possibilities? I mean, this is, this, big, is a big, big this, this is this is the big question. We wrote a report called "What Lies Beneath" about this, and and John Schellenhuber, who was then the director of Pots of the Potsdam Institute, wrote a, a forward, which was very helpful. And I mean, there there are there are scientists around the world who have said to us privately that they think the IPCC should be abolished because it no longer has any useful role to play. People are very frustrated at it. You would have seen in the last 12 months in the lead up to the most recent IPCC report, people like Sir David King in the UK um, had a process of trying to bring scientists together to get out into the media before the IPCC report to tell a stronger story. Um, Jim Hansen in 2007, when he realized the IPCC report was going to be really bad on sea level rises, wrote a scientific paper called Sea Level Rise and Scientific Reticence. It's a wonderful paper from 2007 um, in which he laid out this process. So uh, um, there, there's been long frustrations. I mean, the, the, the problems with the IPCC, I guess, are, are probably uh, three in kind. Um, the first is, is really to do with the scientific method, what we're trying to deal with. I mean, climate science is a very rapidly um, changing field. Um, we Knowledge has probably doubled or tripled in the last three years. It's really evolving quickly. So you've got in the IPCC um, some very specialised reporting when you're trying to deal with a very complex system that really needs a whole system analysis. And that's a contradiction between specialised reporting and, and, and the nature of the system. Uh, the, the second thing is that you've got a very complex system and what I would call lowest common denominator or consensus outcomes. So for example, in the, the summary for policymakers, the drafts of those documents actually go back to the IPCC and the IPCC at its highest governance level are 190 diplomats, not scientists, political diplomats from around the world, from each nation, and they vote sentence by sentence on the summary for policymakers. And Saudi Arabia and Australia, which is a large fossil fuel exporter, if any one country objects to any sentence, it is deleted. It's consensus. And so you get the lowest common denominator. Things get thrown out uh, that should go in there. Um, you've got the problems also of the scientific method itself, which is you have to demonstrate something beyond reasonable doubt. You have to provide black and white evidence uh, um, uh, to, to, for something to be included. Um, but there are uncertainties in the system. So that those uncertainties lead to, to absences. You say to climate scientists, can you say something absolutely? And they'll say no. And do you say, what do you think your what in your heart, what's your best bet? And they'll tell you something different. So their opinions are different from what you can prove in a peer-reviewed paper. Um, you've got an over-reliance on modeling, which we'll come back to. Um, um, a really one-sided reliance on, on physical climate models. 
And that means other forms of knowledge which are just as valuable, particularly uh, from the field of paleoclimatology, that is past climates, the history of past climates, teach us more about the future than models do. But paleoclimatology has really been played down. Uh, and in fact, expert opinion is probably the most useful thing that could be in the, these reports. Um, I'll give you an example. On sea level rises, the most recent IPCC report said on medium emissions, um, the sea level rise this century would be 0.7, less than one metre. You say to scientists, what do you think it will be? They'll all tell you between one and two. I mean, the United States government has a high scenario for sea level rises of two and a half metres. And the United States government is not a radical organization. It's, it's high level scenario is three times that of the IPCC. Um, so what happens is that um, uh, of course, as well, models can't deal with non-linear processes, the ones we were talking about before, so they largely get excluded. Uh, there's little emphasis on the low probability, uh, high impact events. Uh, um, the whole scientific method is, is to look at what you can prove, what's, what's most probable. Um, but what's most important is the high-end possibilities, not the probabilities, but the bad possibilities. And in his report, to, in his um, forward to um, What Lies Beneath, John Shelner Huber said, when the issue is the survival of, of civilization, conventional means of scientific analysis may be useless. Here's, here's a man who has advised Angela Merkel, the EU, the Pope, saying, when it comes to these high-end risks, these existential uh, risks, conventional scientific analysis may be useless. And he's really, without saying it, he's talking about the IPCC. So you've got those methodological problems. There's two other sorts of problems. Um, one is the politics. And this is the most interesting one. I mean, the IPCC is not pure research science. It is science for a political purpose. It is, it is, it is politically relevant science. Um, so it straddles a dividing line between science and policy. And, and one really great example of that is up, till 2000, up until 2015 and the Paris uh, meeting, Scientists and the IPCC, and the IPCC reports on what scientists have researched, scientists didn't look at 1.5 degrees. All the research was on two degrees and three degrees and four degrees, because that's where the political conversation was. There hadn't been research done on 1.5 and under. And in 2015, a political organization, the UNFCCC said, we want you to report on 1.5. And then the scientists went away and started doing research on 1.5. So this is a clear example of the politics leading the scientists in, in, inside the IPCC. Uh, so that's, that's its policy relevant science. Um, the, the, as, as I just mentioned, the governing body of the IPCC is, is um, diplomats. They select the lead authors. Scientists don't select the people who produce this. Political representatives uh, select the authors. Um, uh, they vote by uh, consensus, so it's the lowest common denominator, uh, and um, that leads to certain outcomes, lowest common denominator uh, outcomes. And, and very briefly, I think the third thing is that, as in all these fields, you get a, a sort of sociology of it, um, a, a certain sort of group think, uh, where people don't want to go at too far outside an academic uh, uh, boundary because they're likely to be uh, excluded for, for out of the box thinking. And there are many examples of great scientists basically being disenfranchised because they thought out of the box. Um, and Shell and Huber talked about, uh, and other researchers have talked about erring, erring on the side of least drama. That is basically being conservative being restrained, being objective, being dispassionate, being moderate. Um, so I think all those things contribute to, to uh, an IPCC report, which is which we have called uh, scientifically reticent. Uh, reticence being uh, a reluctance 
an unwillingness to spell out the real risks. So the IPCC reports in summary uh, uh, end up understating the risks. Uh, sorry, that's such a long answer, but it's a big question. Yeah, it's a big question and it's, it's a great answer. Thanks, David. You touched many of, <laughs> a, a lot of issues. Just one, one thing that came into my mind was this, this classic example of from 2007 IPCC report, I think where they, 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 they didn't come to agreement of how much some of the glaciers add to the raising of uh, sea level. So they just excluded it totally out of the prediction. They left it out. <laughs> yeah, this is the thing. If, if there's not unanimous agreement, even amongst the scientists, I mean, because what they do is they get all the papers that have been produced in the previous period, look at them all, and then try and summarize the papers. And so the lead authors in each chapter have a real power. The politically appointed authors have a power about what papers you look at and what you decide to prioritize. And if there are papers that are contradictory or with the evidence somebody says, well, that's not really convincing, then they will get thrown out because of this consensus lowest common denominator uh, approach. And that happens all the time. Um, yeah. Uh, it's, 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 I mean, it's like the scientific method. You can't print, you can't produce a peer reviewed physical science paper unless you have got results that can be reproduced which is fair enough, the same in medicine, but it, may, it seems, it then it means that many things aren't, aren't said. Uh, if you said to a whole lot of cryosphere cry scientists five years ago, do you think Greenland is past its tipping point? They'd all say, yes, I think it's past its tipping point, but we haven't got the data to prove that yet. And that's the problem. Yes, yes, and that- What, what, what the... scientists, what, what, sorry, what scientists, know and think and what they can demonstrate in black and white are two different things. Exactly. And this is why one of our sort of mission is to encourage people to actually talk with the scientists, like write the email, get on the Zoom and <laughs> ask for their actual views and opinions because they, they vary from, from the sort of mainstream, especially from the IPCC consensus type of mm. reporting. Just one, one thing I, I want to add, to the sort of degree limits, as, as you said, 1.5 degrees wasn't really scientifically scrutinized before it was agreed as, as a political target. Uh, this is something people don't really know that the, that the say, sort of safe limits are not, <laughs> they, they don't come from, from the scientific thinking originally. And IPCC yeah. said already in the 90s, I think it was 1995 or something that it's not their job to tell what is uh, what is dangerous and what is not because danger is always related and that's why it's the job of the politicians and this is one reason why we've ended up in this mess. And, and obviously in 2015 a political organization in the UNFCCC um, directed the science to produce a report on 1.5 but nobody's, no scientists have done work on 1 or 0 0.5 to work out whether they would be safe. So there are still huge absences because the, uh, the, I mean, a lot of science funding is directed by governments. Integrated assessment models are funded by governments because they're really expensive and governments have a political agenda. And the agenda had been two degrees and that's why most of the research was about two degrees. It's, 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 it's a loop between governments, the policy making paradigm, science funding and science outcomes. Yes, yes. And I think this is a great way, uh, great point to transition to the next question, which, which is about the integrated assessment models. This is something that, <laughs> okay, yeah, I can see you laughing already. Uh, one of your recent posts, uh, headline of the post says, quote, model-based net zero scenarios, including those of the IPCC, aren't worth the paper they are written on, says leading economists. So could you explain what are the integrated assessment models and what, what they are used for and why, whether or not fit for a purpose? Look, I think this is the biggest scandal 
in, in, in international climate policy making and, and science at the moment, and it is not understood at all. Um, integrated assessment models uh, are said to be models that combine the economy, the energy system and the climate system all into, into one big model. But in fact, if you look at them, they're basically economy and energy models. Integrated assessment models are not produced by climate scientists. This is the first big thing. They're produced by economists and engineers and, and, um, and, and, and programmers. So they don't come from the science community. Uh, what they do is they plug in some science to an economy energy model, um, often not very well. Um, so they're not physical climate models. In fact, the early integrated assessment models didn't even account for the damage that climate change would occur. They were just really asking a question, if you reduce fossil fuels, fossil fuel use, how much is it going to cost? How much is it going to cost was, was, was always the question. Um, uh, the, the article you referred to is, is um, a recent report by Sir Nicholas Stern, who some people may, uh, an economist in the UK who's famous for, for producing a report to UK government in, in 2005, I think, and Joseph Stiglitz, who is a Nobel uh, Prize winning economist. Not that that's always a recommendation, but I think he's one of the better ones. And in a recent paper, they looked at integrated assessment models and they said, and they concluded that they have very little value in answering critical questions. Uh, uh, and they provide little in the way as use of useful guidance. So this is, this is, this is pretty damning. Um, and what they're really pointing to is with climate, we've already talked about with tipping points and non-linearity, the future, even in the climate sphere is very uncertain. We don't know what the climate system will look like. We don't know the amount of damage that two or three degrees of warming will, will have. We cannot put a, a, a numerical figure on the amount of damage in the future. Um, yet these models are trying to run out the economy to 2100, to inflation rates and so on to 0.1% 90 years from now. I mean, economists can't tell you what the inflation rate will be next year, let alone in 90 years time. So the, these models are trying to quantify things which cannot be quantified. I mean, the, the, the most classic example is that these models try, they, they're really a cost benefit analysis. And obviously the big cost of climate change is the damage that will be caused by climate change. Now, it is clear that the damages uh, where we're going are existential. They are beyond numbers. If you've got a model, if you've got a computer and you can't put a number into it, it can't compute. So this is the flaw. It's trying to compute. It's trying to quantify things which can't be quantified. Um, um, I mean, there, there, there are many. This, this, I think, is a fundamental flaw. There are many other flaws. Um, they're, they're, they really have a flawed view of how the economic system works, uh, I think. Um, um, you know, it, it's, cla it's, it's, cl it's classical economics. This is a utility fund. Everything's got perfect knowledge that you get. You get rational outcomes. Uh, um, uh, that markets are efficient. That markets have perfect knowledge. None of which is true. Um, and they're really bad on equity issues. They're bad on equity issues between the north and the south. And they're really bad on intergenerational uh, uh, equity issues because. They use discount rates or, or, or rates about the future, which tend to diminish, to diminish future, co future costs uh, of climate change. So um, uh, I think that, you know, really uh, a researcher said that integrated models um, represent the ideas of the modeler. If the modeler wants to think that will be 30% nuclear power in 2050, that will be in the model. That's not reality. That's just the model, the modeler's assumptions. So they're really arbitrary pictures of the future. And here's the real scandal. And this is where it's really important. If you look at working group three of the IPCC, which talks about what we're going to do and decarbonisation plans and mitigation plans, 
all the mitigation plans in working group three, which then go off to the conference of parties, BUNF C, all those scenarios are based on integrated assessment models. So what policymakers, as they front up to the COP, and they, they're just, you know, to, to Paris or wherever the next one's going to be, um, and they've got the latest IPCC report in their hand, they've got, they've got so-called models and projections of the future, which leading economists say are not worth the paper they're written on. And this, this is the scandal and this is the disaster at, at the centre of international policy making. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, that's complex. <laughs> sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry just, about the, no, 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 it's the bad news. Yeah, well, just, make, just to make it clear. So these IAMs are used for calculating the carbon budgets. Of the yeah, so, right. and, and so, for example, when you see all these companies and things like the central banks through things called the Network for Green, the financial system saying, oh, we've all got a net zero 2050 scenario, and here's what's going to happen. All those scenarios, all those outcomes, all that advocacy about what we need to do are based on integrated assessment models. And yeah. here's the thing. I mean, it, it's so arbitrary. The, um, uh, so the, the central bankers have, have, have a, preferred, um, a, a preferred scenario. This is the World Bank. There's a preferred scenario called, called Net Zero 2050. Because I, I went and looked and I looked at all the databases behind these models. And in that model, it's called Net Zero 2050. But 32% of the primary, 32% of the primary uh, energy is still coming from fossil fuels in 2050. Net zero 2050, the bankers equals one third of primary energy still coming from fossil fuels with lots of offsets. So this is the sort of, you know, dreaming, the illusions that the that, 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 that IMs create. You can assume anything, you know, you can assume that a spaceship will come down and suck up all the carbon dioxide in the air and take it off to Mars and solve the problem. And you can put that into an integrated assessment model. That's okay. You can assume that you're going to somehow capture uh, all this stuff with bioenergy, bioenergy capture, carbon capture and storage and pump it into old oil wells, even though that technology is not proven at scale and doesn't exist at scale anywhere in the world and make that the center of your scenario which is what the Paris Agreement did. It's what all these, what, what uh, all the net zero 2050 IMs are largely doing. They're, they're, you can paint a picture with whatever colored paint you want. It doesn't make, make the picture credible or useful. Yeah, that's really bad. <laughs> that's super bad. And this is like the whole scam of adding these hypothetical technologies to capture directly carbon from the air uh, and how yeah how this has affected the global policies this is also one one problem and challenge for us because we as operative artists we are talking about the need for uh also other intervention than just yeah. just emission mitigation we are talking about taking yeah. carb carbon out of the atmosphere and cooling some critical parts of the planet but people really only know about these carbon vacuums or carbon machines sucking the carbon out of the atmosphere. And that's, that's part, of, part of the reason why people are so sort of against the whole, I, whole I, of the idea. <laughs> I, I think, I think the, the great American climate scientist, Jim Hansen, who I mentioned earlier, you know, who was head of climate science for NASA, I mean, the most credible climate scientist. I mean, some people call him the godfather of modern climate science. He was the first one in 1988 who testified before the US Congress and said climate change is real. Um, um, he talks about integrated assessment models as GIGO, G-I-G-O, which stands for garbage in, garbage out. Okay. So he... <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Great, okay. so. Uh, yeah, maybe we can just go a bit forward or actually, because we, we really try to get like um, the full picture of, of why the public still has 
such an um, optimistic or unrealistic view of all of this. And our, our next question is about uh, modeling maybe more of the Earth system models or the actual climate models. So it's, it's clear that some of, the, some of the sort of key elements of the climate system, some climate feedbacks, for example, the uh, uh, greenhouse gases from the permafrost or uh, decline of the plant carbon sinks, changes in the jet stream are sort of handled insufficiently or even left out from the models, if, if I have understood correctly. Are these, some of these dynamics still <laughs> like as of 2022 badly incorporated in the, into the models? How do you well, see? yes, I mean, and we, should, we shouldn't be too harsh on the models. I mean, climate models are incredible that you can write computer code that even, I mean, yes. for weather, can forecast the weather um, a week in the future and tell you the percentage chance of it raining over your town in a week's time. That to me is incredible that, that we can actually capture the, you know, the fluid dynamics of the atmosphere in ways like that. Um, I mean, I think the problem is that in climate change and in the way the climate systems works, there are two sorts of events. There are linear predictable events. For example, we know with more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, it's like putting a thicker blanket on the bed. Um, it will trap more heat, things will get warmer. We know as the atmosphere gets warmer for every one degree of warming, the amount of, of uh, water vapor in the atmosphere will increase by 7%. So you then get the chance of more intense rainfall because the, the, you, you carry more water vapor. So there are many linear things that the climate models are really good at. All those day by day, week, week by, by week um, uh, uh, processes, which, which can be quantified and, and turned into equations. Uh, but there are things which can't um, or, or which are difficult to, and they're, they're, they can be difficult for two reasons. One is we simply don't know about them. Uh, and the second is that they're not easy to model. They're not linear. Um, um, you know, 30 years ago, scientists thought that Antarctica would be stable for a thousand years. I mean, we've already mentioned scientists saying the Arctic is modeling a thousand years, a hundred years ahead of schedule. Um, um, I don't think anybody, I remember when it was said that you know, the, the tipping point for Greenland was probably about two degrees. That was only 10 or 20 years ago. But with new knowledge, it's now clear that Greenland has tipped at 1.2. Um, so, you know, science is trying to catch up with a, a rapidly changing reality. I mean, things are changing faster than forecast. So that rapid change and, and the nonlinearity of, of large elements of the climate system means that models cannot capture all of it. I mean, there are, there, there are things happening that, that, that scientists are quite happy to say, this is beyond what the models, no models are able to capture the, the, the effects that uh, at the poles will have on sea level rises. The best, the best chance we've got to is to, is to look back in, in, in past history. And if we look at climate history, we know that in the long run, every one degree of warming will produce 10 to 20 meters of sea level rise. This we know, but that's never spoken about. Yes, yes. And I think you, you brought up a great point in saying that models are actually great tools uh, in predicting some things. And we totally agree with this. And I think this is the big challenge uh, for us because we also, like, like Breakthrough uh, Center, we also try to communicate the real challenges in making the science and communicating about it. Uh, and our mission is, is not to undermine the credibility of science, but rather make it, make it more credible in some sense, in trying to explain why, why we have these predictions uh, missing their targets and Look, there, there, are, there are many great forthright, fantastic scientists that we talk to and interview who are, you know, are really upfront which, which, with what's going on. Some of the most important scientists in the world. I mean, Sean Huber, Jim Hansen, Stefan Ramsdorf in, in, in Germany, Sir David King, the former chief scientist in the UK. Many are really upfront and worried about what's going on. It's, it's more that the scientific method, which is, you know, which is methodologically conservative, 
uh, finds really uh, uh, bad outcomes in the IPCC when you also have political interference and lowest common denominator consensus decision making. Yes, yes. And this is like one interesting thing that I, I came across with at university when I was studying the philosophy of science was that our, our uh, professor told that in, in many cases, the people who study the fields, the, the philosophers who study the making of the science in some fields might understand better the mechanisms behind the analysis and, and the pre-assumptions behind some, some methods that are used to actually produce the scientific, yeah. uh, scientific research. And like our, our, one of our analyses is also that uh, many of the researchers might, might fear talking about these challenges and problems because they, they might think that if we bring to the public more of these challenges that uh, climate science face, then we would undermine the credibility of the, of the science know, itself. I and this is, this is a terrible problem. And this is why I think this might be one reason why we have such a few uh, people, scientific, scientists actually out in the public talking about these things. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, there is a certain group think. I mean, the peer reviewed process produces a certain, you know, uh, having, having to work with colleagues. I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a great story about a scientist called John Mercer. Uh, in the 1970s and earlier, who was a glaciologist, a slightly crazy glaciologist, but he was brilliant. And in the late 1970s, he wrote papers. This was just over 50 years ago. He said, I can envisage the rapid deglaciation of, An of West Antarctica 50 years from now. He absolutely nailed it 50 years ago. Uh, but because he was a maverick, uh, people didn't want to believe him. He didn't get research funding. Uh, and in fact, Jim Hansen termed the, 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 um, a phrase which he called the Mercer effect, which was to lose your funding by being too outspoken. Yeah, that's, that's bad. And that's a very interesting story. I think we are also going to tell that that one to our audience is sometime soon about the John Mercer effect. Maybe we can then go to our last, um, last section, which is about risks and thinking about risks. And I think this is oh. something that you have done great work on. And you have pointed out that uh, the current policies are based on scenarios and emission scenarios, which allow for one third or even <laughs> one in half chance of failure. And mm -hmm. this kind of um, acceptance of risks are being actively normalized. What, what is it all about? And why, why did, do you think this is happening? Well, well this goes to the really heart of the problems with climate policy making and, and with the IPCC, um, where I think that there's actually a, a sort of political moral hazard where particularly policy makers are uh, ignoring the real interest, the, the real risks in the interest of political expediency. Because if you, if you understood the risks as they really exist, you'd have to make some very different uh, decisions. Um, uh, I mean, what's risk? Risk, e risk is the likelihood of something happening multiplied by the damage it will cause. So for example, um, people are very concerned about nuclear weapons, even though the, the likelihood of a nuclear war is very low, a very low probability, but the damage would be so enormous that you just don't want to contemplate it. Um, I mean, if you think of, I mean, I think about in our, our own lives, if somebody says, you can bet $10 on a horse or an election outcome, 10 euros on a horse or an election outcome, you'll say, well, look, even if I lose my money, I don't really care because it's only ten dollars and it doesn't really affect me that much. Ten years, it doesn't affect me that much. If somebody says um, you're about to get on in a lift or drive over a bridge or get in an aeroplane, and there's a ten percent chance of, of that structure crashing, you'd say I'm not going to get on it. Um, I mean, I don't think anybody would get on an aeroplane if there was a one percent chance of it crashing. 
because the damage is so high at the end of our life that we don't want to take the risk, even though the likelihood is, 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 is small. And, and so this is the problem because it is now clear that uh, climate change is an existential threat. That is, it is, it is, it is moving to a, a, a stage if we keep on going on the trajectory that, that we are, where there will be a breakdown within and between nations, a, a social break, a, a breakdown driven by water and food insecurity, conflict, forced migration, that, that will bring the modern political global system crashing down. I have no doubt about that. I mean, a lot of people are saying it. Even the US, the, the, the US Secretary of Defense says it, the UN Secretary General says it. Um, so in those circumstances, um, it's not a matter of saying, as the IPCC does, well, we've got a carbon budget uh, and there's a 50% chance if we, if we um, produce this much emissions, there's a 50% chance of staying below two degrees. Because what they're saying is there's a 50% chance of failure. And in fact, a carbon budget that's got a 50% chance of two degrees has got a 10% chance of four degrees. And you wouldn't let your children go into a swimming pool if it was a 10% chance of drowning. But we're accepting a carbon budget. It's got a 10% chance of bringing human civilization to an end. So this is the problem. We're, we're caught in this middle probabilities when, when the, risk, the risk is all at the top end of the probability distribution. As, John, as I quoted John Sheldon Huber earlier, it's not the probabilities in the, in the middle that matter, the 50 or 66 percent, it's the possibilities at the top end. Because when risks are existential or, or life-threatening, I mean, for example, with nuclear weapons, the question that you must ask, the risk management that you have to adopt is, is to say, what's the worst thing that could feasibly happen and what do we have to do to stop it? That's the only question. And that's the question that, that, you know, that, that you're all looking at now. What is the feasible worst outcome in the future? And what do we have to do to stop it? And you're saying, well, the feasible worst outcome is, is a crash of the system. And the only way to stop that crash is to cool the earth back to a safe temperature. But that's not the question that you'll get with a 50% uh, mentality. So um, um, focusing, on, focusing on the middle range outcomes uh, ignores the important possibilities. Yes, yes, great. And from our perspective, like we, we, we believe that one, one problem in creating real change now is that is that people, especially activists or youth groups or whatever, do so little of their own risk analysis and actually question this, this whole, whole thing of why we concentrate on, on the most likely outcomes and not even think about the worst possible outcomes. And you also talked about moral hazard, which, which means basically, just to explain for our audience, is that that sometimes if, if you are not the one who's going to carry the consequences, you might take, you might accept bigger risks because you, yes. you, you think you're not probably going to be there. Look, 16, I mean, uh, look yeah. and I understand that acutely. I mean, uh, according to the tables in Australia, I'm going to live for another 16 years. That's my life expectancy because I'm an oldie. I'm vintage, you know. I've lived most of my life. And so if, 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 the, if the statistical tables are right, I will die in uh, 2037. And so if I was making a personal risk analysis, I would say, well, the world won't, won't, you know, it won't be great, but it'll probably be livable for me and I can still live where I am and things will probably still keep on working in, in another 15 years. But if I was in your shoes and looking at another 50 years, it's a completely different calculation. So the risks are different for different demographics. The risks are different for younger people than older people. They're different for people who are more climate vulnerable. I mean, the capacity to adapt to climate uh, threats 
is largely a capacity of your, of your income, of your socioeconomic status. So people in the developing world are much more vulnerable than people in the developed world. So once again, the risks are different. There's not one risk, there are many risks. So your point about people understanding their own risks is absolutely important. I mean, for example, uh, to the north of Australia, uh, in the Southwest Pacific, there's a large uh, area of corals known as the Coral Triangle, which encompasses another, a number of countries. Um, uh, several hundred million people are dependent on that coral, either for their income, for food, for tourism, or for physical protection against storm surges. Now, if, as is likely in the next 10 to 15 years, coral systems around the world will be destroyed because they're right on the, on the edge now, their risk analysis would say, our lives will be turned upside down by the loss of, loss of this coral. What do we have to do to preserve this coral? And the answer is the earth's gotta be a lot cooler than it is now. So their calculation is probably very different from a bank sitting in London who wouldn't even know what the coral triangle was. Yes, exactly. And this, this is why like we in Opera de Artis, we, we really love this idea of thinking risks actually as the multiply, uh, like multiplication of probability and, uh, of an outcome and, and the consequences of, of that outcome. And, and our perspective is to add into this risk analysis, the fact that you have just pointed out that it's different for everyone. So we, we, we think we need to add the factors of, of who, is gonna, who is gonna carry the consequences, mm -hmm. uh, how, it, it, how intensively and in what, what time. And it's not sufficient to just think about the next 78 years or 17 years <laughs> as you have, you have left <laughs> according to the statistics. So I was sorry to be brutal about this. I mean, the fact is there's one physical, there's one physical climate system, but there are differentiated impacts and risks. Um, there are different climate vulnerabilities. There are disproportionate impacts. And so I think the question for, 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 for your group, for any group of people, for any demographic is, is um, what do you value? What do you want to protect? And what actions do you have to take to protect it? And that's the answer. And, and those questions are never asked by policymakers, ever. There is no normative goal in policymaking. Yes, my, my last question is, is still about this topic and it's, it's about, uh, there's this quite widespread idea uh, in society that, that the facts don't really like, I don't know, motivate people. And this is especially in, in many of the climate campaigns and activist groups is thinking of, mm. we just have to concentrate on the emotions and people don't need to be educated anymore about the, sort of like the facts or, or mm. these kind of things. And we think that we actually need to get youth groups to make their own risk analysis. So what do you think about this sort of underlying uh assumption that yeah we can just forget about the facts and try to try to scare the living shit out of people <laughs> to get them on the move uh this is another big topic we could spend an hour on this one too but we <laughs> maybe, maybe we, um, we can make also an, another uh, bigger no, yes um, oh, please please i mean i mean what's really clear in in sort of this postmodern world is that we are now having the triumph of form over content so what I see in climate advocacy organizations is that the communications is more important than the strategy. You know, it's all about brand and communications and money and members and you know, KPIs. It's, it's not about the, 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 uh, uh, the, the evidence. It's not about the evidence. Um, it's just a, it's, you know, it's, it's the way the world is. It's, 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 it's the, 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 as I said, the triumph of form uh, over content. Um, and obviously, um, 
several years ago, I, I said to a journalist, and it ended up in an editorial, I said, when our book was launched, I said, you cannot negotiate with the laws of physics and chemistry. And this is, this is where it comes back to the evidence, the facts being important. If we try and politically negotiate with the laws of physics and chemistry, which is what policymakers are doing, civilization will come to an end. So the evidence absolutely matters and is primary. And I mean, the great, the great service that, that Greta Thunberg did was drawing attention to that evidence and saying, you are lying, <clears throat> you are lying, you're, you're deceiving, you're not dealing with the real world. And, and that's absolutely uh, um, uh, uh, important. Um, so I, you know, honestly, in, 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 in academic work in psychology, uh, there's good work that shows that the truth motivates more. That um, fear, I mean, you need fear and hope both, but fear is, is a greater motivator than hope. I, I don't particularly like the fear versus hope thing because it's a false dichotomy. If you look at um, health promotion, anti-smoking, for anti-smoking campaigns, for example, you need both. You need to say, you're going to die, fear, but here's the hope. You can bring this hotline and we'll show you how to stop smoking. Here's how you can do it. Uh, I don't think it's about, I don't think it's about fear and hope. I think it should be about courage and honesty, which is what I think Greta um, um, exhibited. Um, at the same time, I mean, I think we have to find language that communicates with people. Um, you know, many years ago, when I was writing a book, the phrase that policymakers used and, and NGOs, everybody, advocates, everybody was using it was that the goal, which was established in the UNFCCC, was uh, to prevent, quote, dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system, unquote, which is just gobbledygook. And I thought and thought and thought about it and I thought, and in the end, I thought, well, what the goal really should be is a safe climate. Two words, which has a value in it, a safe climate. So, I mean, I think it's really important that we, that, you know, that we do find language that, 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 that reflects, um, uh, that, 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 that motivates people. Um, you know, um, I was thinking, when we were thinking about climate emergency, because it, it, it's clear, for example, that the whole policymaking paradigm, whether it be the UNFCCC or global bankers, all have one overwhelming desire, and that is that climate, that the response to climate change should be gradual, incremental, non disruptive in the business and politics as usual frame. That's the paradigm of policymaking, and it is clear that we cannot succeed with that. I mean, we now have to make climate change, the first priority of economics and politics. Every country needs to say climate change is our number one political concern and we will spend whatever money we need to to solve it, which would be highly disruptive, both of politics and of the economics. That's necessary. And that's why we came up with the word emergency, because um, you know, we know in an emergency, whether it's a fire or a flood or a storm, you cast aside the normal um, running of society in order to deal with the immediate problem. That's why I thought emergency was a good idea because it has that sense about it. And I was thinking about emergencies and, and how people understand emergencies. And I, I remember I was standing under a shower too long one day <laughs> thinking about this and thinking about emergencies in hospitals. And I dashed out and, and sort of Googled, what are the words for an emergency in a hospital? And they had code red, code blue, and code purple. The three different types of emergencies. And I thought, well, warming is red. So let's talk about code red. And so we got the climate code red, which I think worked because it linked a really clear object, object that is an emergency, but in language, code red, that people would understand. So I don't think we have to sacrifice the evidence in order to communicate well. That's excellent. Uh, I think this is this is a topic we might want to go into a bigger discussion sometime soon, hopefully, with you again. Uh, thank you very much again, 
uh, David, for joining us. And yeah, I hope for all the best for you. Thank you very much, Anton. And all the best with your work. I look forward to hearing how you go.